Okay, great. So, uh, so let's start. So, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in uh, Singapore. So, um, I guess this is a two-part lecture uh, about dynamic contracts. And um, I want to start by uh, talking about some broad ideas uh, and uh, um, to try to stimulate some thinking and, you know, after, afterwards in the evening maybe if, if uh, we, maybe you can talk more. Um, always happy to learn new things. Uh, and then eventually I will have to uh, narrow it down to, uh, you know, a more specific uh, uh, example. So dynamic contracts are important in economics and uh, they arise in uh, many different fields. So uh, in corporate finance, uh, the question of uh, capital structure of a firm, um, so uh, how much debt and how much equity the firm has and what kinds of incentives capital structure creates for, uh, for example, conflict of interest between debt holders and uh, equity holders is uh, one example. Uh, executive compensation is uh, uh, another example. Uh, in macro, it's a, a big question. So, uh, for example, the question of uh, optimal dynamic taxation and uh, uh, maybe the types of distortionary incentives that uh, taxes uh, generate, uh, labor contracts and industrial organizations. And uh, uh, so one aspect of principal agent models is, okay, so uh, you reward the agent for uh, good outcomes and you punish the agent for bad outcomes. And so in this talk, I want to uh, talk about another dimension, which is uh, a bit more subtle and it basically has to do with uh, uh, dynamic adverse selection. Okay, so the agent has some private information um, and uh, uh, this private information, uh, you know, the agent could be uh, uh, born with it or it can be generated by the agent's past actions. And the question is, well, how does the principal deal with it? So um, just to put things into perspective, so one application we could think about is uh, uh, optimal dynamic uh, uh, taxation, for example, Murley's model. So uh, here the typical setting is that uh, the agent has some skill, and uh, uh, this skill is uh, uh, evolving over time. And uh, sometimes uh, his skills are more suitable for the current economy, or it could be that he is unlucky and the technology has changed and his uh, skills maybe are uh, less relevant. But the agent has private information about his skills. And uh, uh, the question is, well, uh, how can, uh, in the situation, the government redistribute, if it wants to redistribute, uh, and how to take uh, care of uh, incentives. So, uh, you know, to redistribute, but uh, still uh, uh, have uh, incentives. It's, it's a question. So this is a very different uh, uh, example. So uh, it's from uh, industrial organizations, uh, dynamic price discrimination, okay. So here, um, the firm is selling to some uh, customers. Uh, and the customers, they have private information about how much they value the product. And basically, the firm wants to price discriminate, to charge more customers who are more willing to pay for the product. And, uh, uh, and, and so the offer, the future offer is that the customer uh, can receive, uh, can depend on the, um, can depend on the, uh, on the information that the customer has uh, revealed uh, uh, in the past. Okay. Um, and uh, this uh, private information that the agent has, it can be, uh, so, you know, it can be some type of a stochastic process. So uh, in uh, these dynamic taxation models, the skill shock is exogenous. Um, uh, or it could be that, um, so for career concerns is another example where 
Uh, again, I guess the, the agent skill is, is uh, exogenous and the agent can potentially try to mislead the principal about his skill, for example, by working harder to, to pretend that he has higher skill than the principal uh, thinks, okay? Uh, and this private information can also be generated by past actions. Um, so, for example, the agent could be putting effort and uh, this makes the firm more profitable and uh, this is the agent's private information that he has made the, the firm more profitable by past effort. Or the agent could do something the opposite. The agent could uh, uh, go for short-term uh, results uh, at, the cost of, uh, at, the long, at, the, at the cost of having some long-term costs uh, and basically have the private information that uh, uh, he basically used the resources to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, short-term performance. Uh, and another example is, I guess, hidden savings. So hidden savings is uh, basically the uh, agent can try to uh, undo incentives by uh, uh, having savings, and, uh, and it's a concern. And the agent could have uh, private information about savings. OK, so in these settings where the agent has private information, so it could be generated by the agent's past actions or it could be, uh, uh, you know, the agent could just learn something. Uh, the ways to deal with it is uh, what matters is the agent's information rent. So Meyerson calls it the agent's information rent and this term information rent comes from uh, the rent that, uh, the agent has from having better private information, okay? So, uh, for example, uh, a firm could have a, a low value customers and high value customers, and uh, uh, it, it wants to extract as much rent as possible from uh, both customers, but uh, the high value customer can pretend to be a low value customer, and so you have to leave some rents to the high value customers. Okay. And uh, so what matters is basically the uh, payoff that the agent gets as a function of uh, uh, his private information. So let's see where is it. So it's, it's this, this function. Okay. And uh, there is an approach which um, uh, looks at dynamic contracts by uh, looking at the entire uh, payoff of the agent as, as a function of... Uh, uh, his private information, and there is also a first order approach that uh, uh, just looks at uh, first order incentive conditions and then later we hope for the best. Okay? Uh, so, um, so, in these types of um, environments where the agent has private information, what is it that we can say in general? So, what is it, what are kinds of some of the things that we can look for? Uh, when we think about optimal design of incentives. And uh, uh, one of the things that seems very general is basically the idea of distortions. That is, you uh, distort the contract ex post in order to improve incentives ex ante. Okay. So uh, ex post, you, maybe you end up in the suboptimal um, uh, situation, right? And maybe you want to renegotiate, but Exante uh, committing to having those distortions helps uh, incentives uh, Exante. So, for example, uh, a firm can uh, uh, have uh, be, can be selling cars. So, suppose you are selling cars, okay? And uh, you have uh, high value customers and you have low value customers. And basically, you want to get the high-value customers to pay a lot for a car and with uh, different features. So you, you put in the navigation system, you put in you know, uh, all of those cameras, um, you, know, you put uh, 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 automatic driving. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but these people that you're trying to get the value from they're going to be thinking, well, you know, why should I be paying for these features, right? Because, you know, I can, I can get a more basic car and, and pay a lot less. Uh, so because they're thinking this way, maybe what you want to do is make the basic car worse, okay? 
So, so basically, make everything in the, in the basic version of the car, everything manual. So it, it, maybe it costs you nothing to put the navigation system in the basic car, but, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the low value customer is actually willing to pay something for the navigation system, but you distort. So you actually make that car worse uh, in order to uh, basically, uh, so, so, so you make the basic car worse for the, for the uh, low value customer so that the high value customer has incentives to pay up, right? So, so of, of course, exposed, you know, after the low value customers, uh, uh, they bought the, the car, there are incentives to renegotiate. Okay, but what I want to show is that, what I want to say is that these, this feature of like exposed distortions in order to improve incentives ex ante, they're everywhere in, in these settings. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, I can talk in general terms for a long time. So what I'm going to do uh, instead is, uh, um, so, I mean, I can talk in general terms only for so long, you know, at that point. <laughs> at, at, at some point I have to be more, more specific, otherwise, you know, uh, uh, otherwise what are we talking about? So, uh, so let me uh, give a specific example and, and build on this idea, in, in particular the idea of uh, distortions. And, the, and I'll talk about this specific paper, it's uh, with Sebastian Ditella, and it's uh, basically about hidden savings. So the idea here is that um, the agent can, uh, uh, the principal may want to give the agent some incentives, for example, to work hard, okay? Uh, and uh, the agent may want to try to protect himself, basically using, using savings, okay? And uh, this is a paper about uh, uh, optimal asset management. Um, and there is a specific uh, narrow application, basically incentivizing portfolio managers, okay? And uh, it's going to be a nice application because uh, um, it gives us some uh, tractable math, okay? So uh, port uh, optimal portfolio choice problem has basically been a classic problem, you know, for a long time. And, uh, you know, Merton has, uh, has studied it and there's some very tractable math connected with, with this problem. But we think about um, like asset managers more generally. So for example, it doesn't have to be somebody that manages financial assets, so it could be, uh, for example, uh, a CEO, and uh, the CEO is ma managing the firm's physical assets and how to incentivize the CEO, okay. Or it could be maybe an application to incentivizing um, government officials. So for example, it could be somebody uh, uh, like a government official and they get some resources maybe to build a road, okay. Um, and uh, uh, maybe they have incentives to uh, basically steal some of the resources and put them aside in a, in, a, in a Swiss bank account. Maybe there's corruption, okay. So, you know, so that could be, you know, one, one of the situations. Uh, so, uh, so, there is a, so there is a, there is a specific application, but I want to, want to say is that the, the intuitions that we can get, they, they apply more broadly. Um, so, but the, the specific application is uh, uh, there is an, there's going to be an agent who manages a, a portfolio. So there is a, a classic portfolio problem. Um, and uh, there's going to be some nice math because the agent who manages a portfolio will have CRRA preferences, so constant relative risk conversion. Um, and uh, because of that, it's going to be a scale invariant setting. Okay, so somebody uh, who is uh, twice as wealthy can be given a fund which is uh, twice as big to, to manage. Um, and uh, well, this scale invariance helps us solve the problem, but it also can help us get certain intuitions which would be hard, harder to see in, uh, in an otherwise more complicated setting. Okay. Uh, and, uh, there are two hidden actions. One of them is that the agent can basically divert some of the uh, 
resources to, to consume perks or to, um, you know, uh, to, to get some benefits. And then another action is basically about savings. So a big part of, the, of this is, is about savings. And how this fits in the earlier theme is that the agent is going to have private information about his savings. The, uh, and this is, a, this is private information that basically uh, it's a dynamic adverse selection, right? So the agent has this private information um, and the principal has to, to take it into account. Uh, and the fact that the agent has this private information, uh, it's going to generate some distortions in the optimal contract. So, uh, so, so let's see exactly, you know, how it can play out. Uh, so what's interesting about the setting is that it's connected to uh, like very clean classic portfolio choice theory problem. Uh, there's going to be some scale invariance that helps us understand the uh, uh, complex dynamics. And uh, uh, where savings come in is that precautionary savings motive is going to worsen incentives. Okay. Uh, so the agent has private information about savings. Uh, and uh, that's, that's something that the agent has private information about. And they mentioned earlier that they, what matters is the agent's information rent, basically the value that the agent gets from uh, having one private information versus another. And so here uh, that means that the, the value that the agent assigns to savings matters. Okay. Uh, and uh, whenever there is this uh, private information problem, dynamic adverse selection, there are distortions, okay? And so it will be a feature of the optimal contract that future distortions improve the agent's incentives ex ante and mitigate the precautionary motive, okay? So what does it mean? So in other words, um, um, I think I might spoil the movie, but uh, uh, what it means is that the, the principal will commit to give the agent some safety in the future to reduce the precautionary motive. And this will improve incentives ex ante uh, and ex post the commitment to the safety is, uh, uh, in the, is inefficient because ex post maybe the principal wants to make the agent work hard again and to give him strong incentives. But from the ex ante point of view, this is, uh, this is uh, optimal, okay? And, the, and you know, we come back to the theoretical question of uh, are first order conditions sufficient or uh, not sufficient? Uh, okay. So uh, let me explain the formal model. Uh, so uh, there is a principal and an agent, and uh, the agent is going to manage some capital. So what's special about the agent is that the agent uh, has some special skills, some, some secret sauce, uh, and uh, he can generate some excess, excess returns. So uh, he, he, he's good at managing this capital. Um, and so the, the principal can give the agent some capital to manage. It can be determined by a contract how much capital the, the agent gets to manage. Okay. And how much capital the agent gets to manage, it could be a function of past performance also. And uh, whatever capital the agent manages, uh, the agent is uh, earning this return. So uh, it's the risk-free rate uh, plus some, so this is idiosyncratic risk. So the agent's uh, uh, investment strategy could be a market neutral strategy, so it's orthogonal to the observables, okay, for example, market return. So this is uh, idiosyncratic. Okay. And it's important that, so because uh, uh, any noise which is uh, correlated with uh, uh, existing observables, you can basically filter it out. Okay. So the interesting part is what happens when the noise is uh, orthogonal to observables. A and the, the agent can generate some alpha. Okay. So uh, if risk is completely orthogonal to everything uh, else you have, 
then this risk is, uh, in finance is diversifiable. So it carries a zero risk premium. And, and so the required return here is the risk free rate. Uh, and the, the agent is able to generate some alpha, uh, some return in excess of the required return. Okay. So the agent is given these resources, uh, but uh, he can divert some of them. Okay. And uh, this is a diversion action. Uh, and uh, the agent can use the uh, diverted funds for uh, consumption or uh, to save, okay? Uh, and uh, so the agent can have some hidden savings which uh, uh, he can use to uh, self-insure because in the future he can be exposed to risk. So the savings, they, they earn the risk-free rate. This is the same rate as that. Uh, and uh, the agent gets some compensation. So he can put the compensation into his hidden savings. Uh, uh, and then he chooses how much to consume. So, uh, and uh, th these are basically the diverted funds. Okay. So, uh, so do... Do fund managers actually steal? Uh, we can discuss this, but but we do not have to interpret it basically. You know, the agent is literally stealing to save. Maybe the agent is uh, uh, you know using the funds resources to consume some perks, so that adds to his consumption. Um, and uh, uh, how he saves is basically he saves some of his legitimate compensation. Uh, and he basically puts it away to, to try to protect himself against the uh, future risk. Okay. So, uh, let's assume that savings are non-negative. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is the interesting case because, uh, so, uh, uh, standard principal agent models uh, where the agent cannot save there is a result, uh, you know, Rogerson, Radner, uh, Spear, and Sirvastava all result that the, uh, if the agent had access to savings, he would want to save. Okay. Uh, so, so basically, the relevant constraint is uh, one of saving and not of borrowing. Okay. Uh, you know, but we can also talk about, uh, you know, other possibilities. Uh, but, so in the baseline model, the agent can divert resources and then the agent can save secretly. Uh, that's the baseline model. But we can talk about situations where uh, there are some interesting questions. What, what can happen if the agent can basically use hidden savings to boost returns? Okay. And what can happen if uh, the agent could also borrow and maybe borrow and then boost, boost returns? So those are also interesting questions, but you know, that's not a part of the baseline model. Okay, and the agent's utility is Sierra Ray, uh, constant relative risk aversion, and this gives some scaling value. So this is the agent's expected utility. He has this count rate rho, and uh, uh, that's his uh, risk aversion coefficient. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, so, Okay. Oh, uh, so um, let me explain just this one little thing. So there is a parameter. It could be one. So uh, diversion of funds is costly. So it could be that if the agent diverts a dollar, he could get you know fifty cents because he has to you know do some manipulations in order to divert. Um, and then if the agent manages capital K, this is the return. So it's per unit of wealth invested. So then uh, the total diversion is uh, A times K. Okay, this is just a matter of notation. Okay, so what kind of contracts can the principal write for the agent? So the principal can observe the past history of performance, so the past history of returns, but the principal does not uh, no, distinguish noise from diversion. Okay, so it could be that the agent diverts some funds and attributes it just to bad luck. Okay, so the principal observes uh, the past history of returns, past history of performance. And the principal specifies 
through a contract uh, how much the agent is compensated and uh, uh, how much capital to give to the agent to manage. Okay. So, so the principle is determining two things, the agent's compensation and whether uh, to give the agent a bigger uh, uh, fund to manage or a smaller fund to manage. Okay. Um, and uh, in this setting, uh, cash diversion is inefficient, so it's efficient to write a contract that basically prevents the agent from diversion. Because if, if uh, you have a contract which uh, allows the agent to divert some money, then you can write uh, instead uh, an equivalent contract which uh, uh, pays the agent directly the diverted funds. Uh, and uh, this contract uh, will be equivalent for the agent, but strictly better for the principal because the principal uh, saves some of the diversion costs. Uh, and uh, another point is that, so the agent has hidden savings, uh, and you could write a contract where, and you can determine uh, the agent's incentives to save, in that contract. So there is always an equivalent contract in which instead of letting the agent save, the principal just saves for the agent and, and pays him later. So without loss of generality, we can focus on contracts where the agent does not save. Okay. So the principal's objective is to minimize the cost of compensating the agent. Uh, so this is uh, minus the principal's profit. So this is the cost of compensating the agent. And I, I should interpret this equation because it's a little bit hard to read. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a simple expression, but it's actually a little bit hard to read. So because um, the cost of compensating the agent is just the discounted cost, so R is the principal's discount rate, also the risk free rate, is just the discounted cost of compensation. Okay. Minus the, the benefit that the agent is generating. And the benefit is that the agent is generating is that uh, is basically the profit. So uh, the alpha that the agent is generating times the the funds that the agent gets to manage. Okay, and you, you can write this expression equivalently uh, if you uh, comp calculate all of the fund inflows and all of the fund outflows and, and integrate that. Okay, but but it's going to end up the same thing. Okay, so basically this is the profit that the agent is generating. It's, it's the alpha that the agent is generating times the size of the fund that, that he gets to manage. Okay, so this is the objective function. And uh, the constraints are that the uh, agent is uh, supposed to get some payoff from the contract and uh, uh, then the incentive constraints that it's optimal for the agent to uh, not divert funds and uh, uh, so not to save because this, this was out loss of generality. And uh, if principles are competitive, then of course this is going to be determined by the condition that the principal breaks even. So basically, uh, that would have the cost of. So the principal breaks even means that the cost of compensating the agent has to equal to the uh, the agent's wealth initially. Okay, so the agent comes with some wealth. Okay, uh, and then he uh, instead of Investing on his own, he writes a contract with the principal, uh, and uh, uh, this wealth that the agent is putting uh, into into the the fund is basically the cost of uh, giving the agent certain utility. So, so that would be uh, the condition then. Okay. So, but uh, as a function of the history of returns, the the uh, the principal is uh, specifying the agent's compensation and uh, um, and and how much funds the agent gets to manage. So so it, it sounds complicated, right? So so maybe we should think about something simple first. So, so you know think about let's think about autarky first. But uh, before I talk about autarky, there are some other questions that. Uh, uh, might come up. So one of the questions is, well, there is saving. What about borrowing? That's one question. Uh, you know, maybe the agent wants to uh, secretly boost returns. 
uh, some other cache diversion technologies, nonlinear, uh, or, uh, well, the agent can save secretly at the risk-free rate. What if the agent can save secretly in his own technology or in the market is, is another question. So there are a bunch of other questions that uh, um, we can discuss later, okay? But uh, in the baseline setting, the agent can only divert uh, funds uh, and uh, the agent can only save but not borrow, okay? So uh, talking about contracts is uh, uh, complicated, but uh, like the standard portfolio choice problem is much simpler. So uh, maybe it's useful to talk about what would happen here just to understand the setting better and also to recall some uh, classic po portfolio choice math. Uh, maybe it's better to talk about uh, classic optimal consumption and portfolio choice problem. So if there is no principle and the agent can invest in his risky technology, which, which has this return, and can also save at the risk-free rate, okay, uh, on his own, then what would be the outcome? So, so basically this ends up uh, an optimal consumption and portfolio choice problem. The agent starts with some wealth, chooses how to allocate wealth between uh, uh, risk-free asset and uh, risky asset, uh, and uh, chooses how much to consume out of his wealth, okay? And this is a type of a problem that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, there are basically some standard formulas to, to solve it, and this is something that, you know, uh, this, this is the stuff that, you know, you, you, can, you can teach to, to an undergraduate, you know, how to, how to solve this, this problem. Uh, but the two basic questions here, one of the questions is uh, how to allocate wealth between risk-free and risky asset, and the second question is what's the optimal consumption rate, Okay. Uh, and uh, the wealth allocation, so this is the law of motion of the agent's wealth, and the agent allocates some of the wealth to the uh, risky asset and allocates some of the wealth to the risk-free asset uh, and then consumes uh, uh, out of his wealth. So the agent's problem here in autarky is to maximize utility subject to this uh, law of motion. Okay, and. Uh, there is a formula for lambda, and there is a formula, the portfolio weight and the risk asset, and there is a formula for how much to, to consume, okay? And uh, the formula for lambda is basically that uh, the allocation to the risky asset, I mean, that's the formula, but the logic is this. Uh, so you could, you could do dynamic programming to derive this, right? But uh, so the allocation to the risky asset has to be such that the agent's risk exposure, so there is a risk sigma here, okay? Uh, and lambda times sigma, if the agent puts, if the, the, if the volatility here is 10% uh, and the agent puts 50%, of his wealth and the risky asset, then the volatility of his wealth is going to be 5%, right? So what does it mean volatility 5% is that in a year, the agent's wealth is gonna go, uh, you know, could go up or could go down, but the standard deviation is, is gonna be 5%. Okay. Uh, so the, vo the, the volatility of the agent's wealth, how much wealth, how much risk the agent will take on, equals to the uh, sharp ratio of uh, risk investment divided by the risk aversion coefficient. Okay, so that's, that's the formula, and it's intuitive. So sharp ratio is basically how much return you get for, for the risk, okay? And when the sharp ratio is bigger, then the agent will choose to take on more risk because this is more attractive risky investment, okay? And when the agent is more risk averse, then the agent will, will choose to take on less risk. So this is a very intuitive formula. And then uh, the formula for how much to consume, it's basically this formula, uh, you know, you, you can sort of like try to d disentangle it, but uh, it's, um, you know, if, yeah, this is the formula, okay? Uh, and, 
you know, you can talk about income effect, you can talk about substitution effect, you can talk about uh, uh, basically uh, equating marginal utility of consumption to the marginal uh, uh, utility of wealth. The value function is basically that formula. Okay. So, all right. So the question is, well, um, this is what the agent can get in autarky. Um, and uh, is it possible to do better if the agent writes a contract with the principal? And uh, so one of the parameters is basically that uh, diversion of funds is, is costly, okay? So, so basically, uh, because of that, you know, like yes, the, the agent can do better with the principal. But it turns out that even if, uh, uh, even if uh, diverting funds uh, the agent can basically steal funds costlessly. He can still enter a contract with the principal, which will uh, achieve a better outcome. Okay. So, so how can the principal uh, achieve a better outcome? So. The principal can offer the agent some insurance. Uh, and so here's a, here's a class of simple contracts uh, which can be solved using basically these formulas. Okay? Uh, and so that's why sort of like I wanted to, to talk about them and to give some intuition. So, what the principal can do, let's think about these contracts. So the principal can uh, uh, observe how, uh, how the total portfolio value evolves, okay? Uh, but the principal doesn't see the agent secretly diverting funds from the portfolio, but the principal sees the total portfolio value, okay? Uh, and the principal can swap a fraction of uh, uh, realized um, uh, realized uh, growth of the portfolio with uh, basically risk-free growth. Okay, so offers insurance. So the agent's portfolio, you know, moves up and down, and uh, uh, Whenever it goes up, uh, you know, it went up by, uh, uh, by a million dollars. So the principal taxes the agent uh, takes away 100,000. The portfolio goes down by a million dollars. The principal gives the agent uh, 100,000, okay? Uh, and uh, so let's try to understand this class of contracts. So what uh, gives some bite here? So what gives some bite here is basically the assumption that the, that the principal can control K. So the principal can control, the principal does not uh, uh, simply give the agent insurance, but the principal can place some restrictions uh, on uh, the uh, portfolio allocation, how much is invested in the risky asset versus uh, risk-free asset. So lambda is one of the contract parameters, um, and chi, the amount of insurance, is one of the contract parameters, and G is one of the contract parameters. Okay, and then the agent will choose how much to consume out of the portfolio. You know, he, he might as well be basically diverting funds uh, secretly uh, for uh, consumption. Okay, so um, so how to solve what kinds of contracts are incentive compatible? Okay, so there are three conditions. So. Uh, One of the conditions is that the principal has to break even in giving insurance. And then two conditions for the agent. So we have to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the agent to understand the agent's incentives. One of the conditions is that uh, the uh, agent does not want to have any hidden savings. And the second condition is that uh, whatever the principal thinks the agent is consuming, 
uh, this, is, this should be really the agent's optimal consumption rate. So the agent should not have incentives, for example, to divert more funds and to consume more. So that's, that's another condition, okay? So, and these two conditions are basically these exact two conditions, okay? Because uh, the condition of uh, the agent does not want to have hidden savings is, uh, uh, well, the agent can, uh, divert some money and put it into hidden savings, he basically changes the allocation. So the agent, so it's like a portfolio problem, right? So this is like a portfolio problem. And the agent is allocating funds to his hidden savings and uh, uh, to the principal, to this insured portfolio, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then the agent is also choosing how much to consume out of the whole portfolio. Okay, uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that if you want to solve it and if you want to apply these uh, uh, standard formulas is that uh, the agent's total wealth is not uh, uh, N, but uh, from the point of view of the agent because the principal gives him insurance, the agent's wealth is not N, but N divided by chi. Okay, because, uh, because uh, there is N in the fund, but because of insurance, the agent can pull out basically uh, more money, more than N, so the agent can pull out this much money. So the agent's wealth is the total that he can pull out plus, plus the, the savings. And basically that's, um, okay. And, and then, you know, this is, this is the condition that uh, uh, is the optimal allocation of wealth between hidden savings and uh, this insured portfolio. So the Sharpe ratio, uh, divided by gamma has to equal to the volatility of the agent's wealth. Uh, this is the condition which determines this ratio uh, C divided by N, except that the agent's wealth from his point of view is because of insurance is actually bigger. Uh, okay, so th the basic point is that we can use, uh, you know, uh, standard formulas to solve for these contracts and this is like, uh, this could be an exercise, you know, for a graduate class to basically, to figure out, to derive this class of contracts. Okay, so now the question is, well, uh, can the principle actually improve the outcomes through these contracts? So in order to answer this question, there are two perspectives, okay? One is the perspective of the agent, right? and his incentives, and another one is the perspective of the principal, okay? So from the perspective of the principal, so the principal monitors uh, basically the, the value of the portfolio, okay? So the, from the perspective of the agent, his wealth is N divided by chi because of insurance. But the actual investment for the principal's valuation is, is N. Uh, and the law of motion of N is basically the agent is generating some alpha and the portion that's invested in the risky asset he is consuming. Uh, and the principal is providing insurance, so he's basic, the principal is removing some risk. So from the, from the principal's point of view, this is the law of motion of the uh, agent's, uh, of the, uh, of the agent's wealth, okay? And uh, when the uh, principal starts providing insurance, then uh, insurance, reduces the agent's risk exposure, but of course any type of insurance comes with moral hazard, okay? And the moral hazard is that, uh, so uh, in this formula, the, the agent is, is basically getting, you know, a much higher sharp ratio, well, a higher sharp ratio because of insurance, and this reduction in risk so because of the reduction in risk, this has a first order effect and efficiency, okay? Uh, but, but the moral hazard is basically relative, relative to other key, relative to other key. The moral hazard is distorting the agent's uh, con consumption and distorting uh, portfolio allocation relative to that optimum. And initially those effects are second order. And so basically, the cost of moral hazard is initially second order, but the reduction in risk is initially first order. And so, uh, it's, so this, is, this, is not, this is not obvious, right? This is not obvious. But it's interesting that 
you know, that you can improve efficiency that way. Okay, and of course, the, the lever that the agent can pull is that the, the, the lever that the principal can pull is that the principal can control the allocation between the risky asset uh, and the risk-free asset of the agent's portfolio. Okay, and so this is a simple contract. Okay, and it improves uh, efficiency relative to autarky. Uh, and uh, one remark I, I want to make is that it works even if uh, the agent can have hidden borrowing, uh, and even if the agent can uh, uh, put the funds, put uh, uh, you know, consume less and, and boost returns. Okay, and uh, why this observation is true is basically well, uh, it's we solve for the outcome based on optimal portfolio math. So uh, the optimal portfolio weight on hidden savings is zero. It means that, well, the agent doesn't want to borrow either. His first order condition basically holds with equality. And um, this observation is kind of a, a nice observation because uh, it, uh, it's a simple contract and uh, it uh, confirms you know, this old intuition that you know, why simple contracts are attractive is because they're robust. So, Robust means that if the agent can deviate in, in different ways, then uh, 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 the simple contract uh, can, uh, you cannot game a simple contract, right? If you design a complicated contract and if the agent has some deviations that you don't know about, then the agent can figure out you know, complicated ways to dodge the, the complicated rules. But, but here, you know, it's, it's simple and, uh, and it works also with borrowing and with, um, and with uh, using boosting returns in the, in the short run. Okay, so uh, one of the things I started with is distortions, okay? So the question is, what are the distortions here, okay? Um, and uh, the thing is, this is not really a dynamic contract, okay? Basically, it gives the, the agent, uh, you know, insurance level which is constant over time, okay? So, so because this is not a dynamic contract, but really a static contract, it's really, there are distortions here, but it's hard to talk about distortions here. Okay, it's hard to talk about distortions because the incentives and the distortions, they're all mushed together in this, in this contract. Okay, so it's, it's hard to talk about distortions. So I'm not going to talk about distortions at this point. Okay, I'm going to come back to talking about distortions later. So uh, what about the uh, optimal contract? So, okay, so the... Uh, the principal can give the agent insurance. And uh, this insurance uh, improves the, the outcome relative to autarky. Okay, fine. But uh, what is the optimal contract? Is it a simple contract or is it more complicated? Uh, so if we want to talk about the optimal contract, then... Uh, uh, we have to introduce some notation uh, in order to uh, characterize in a, in a general form the agent's incentives to uh, divert uh, funds and the agent's incentives to save. So the agent has two actions. Um, and incentives in the most general form uh, so this is, this is not going to be incentives in a completely general form because what I'm going to do first is I'm going to look at the incentives to uh, divert funds first, separately, and then I'm going to look at incentives to save uh, separately. And uh, there's also the question of joint deviations, okay? So I'm going to uh, postpone that question until, until later, okay? So basically, I'm going to ignore some of the incentive constraints for now, this is the first order approach, and then we have to verify later. Okay, so the incentives to um, not divert funds, this is basically the, the skin in the game constraint. So the incentives are captured by the agent's promised utility. Okay, so they, the, the agent's uh, expected 
future utility from the contract um, on, on, on the path of the contract. And what matters is uh, the, how the agents expected the utility respond to realized returns. So the principal creates incentives by uh, rewarding the agent after good returns and punishing the agent after uh, bad returns. And what matters is uh, delta, which is the sensitivity of the agent's utility to returns. Okay. So uh, if, the agent's, uh, if the agent is exposed to more risk through the contract, so he gets a better, higher reward uh, after good outcomes and the and the lower and the worse punishment after bad outcomes, then delta is higher than incentives are stronger. Okay, and if the agent's incentives are stronger, then what does it mean? Well, it means that you can trust him with uh, more resources, so you can give him more resources to manage. So uh, you can give him more capital. Okay. Uh, but let, let me sort of like take a look at this incentive constraint uh, uh, and, and actually explain it in terms of math. So the agent's thinking is this. The agent can steal a dollar of returns. Uh, so he steals for, 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 uh, for every single unit of capital, he steals a dollar. So the total amount he steals is going to be K, the total amount of capital he has, times uh, you know, the, the cost of diversion. Okay? And uh, when the returns go down by a unit, then his utility goes down by a unit according to this equation. By, sorry, by delta according to this equation. Okay? So the, the, his punishment delta has to be bigger than his benefit from the diverted funds. And these diverted funds, they have to be valued at the agent's marginal utility. Okay, so C minus gamma is the agent's marginal utility. So this is the incentive constraint. And the marginal utility is basically what is the agent's current consumption. That's, that's his marginal utility. Okay, but uh, one observation uh, I should make here about this incentive constraint is that one of the things that the strength of incentives depends on, well, it depends on delta. But another thing that it depends on, well, it depends on uh, the agent's marginal utility, right? So if uh, uh, the agent has a big precautionary motive and he's saving uh, as much as he can and he's consuming very little, then his marginal utility of consumption is going to be higher and this incentive constraint is going to be much tighter. Okay. So, so with savings, precautionary savings motive makes the agent consume less and, and harms incentives in this setting. Okay. So that's about the incentives to to steal. The incentives to save, well, um, 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 I don't have to talk about it very much because it's very standard. The, there's the Euler equation, which basically says that the uh, marginal utility of consumption times you know, an appropriate adjustment has to be a, a martingale, okay? And that's the, that's the incentives to to save, that's the Euler equation. So, uh, and uh, this incentive constraint, it turns out that it takes care of um, deviations just with stealing. The Euler equation, if the Euler equation holds and the agent does not uh, want to basically deviate with, uh, with savings, uh, but the, the question of joint deviations is, is still an open question, so I'm going to ignore it for, for now, okay? So, uh, let's see. Okay. So, so here, I promised earlier on that um, this is a convenient setting because we can exploit some scale invariance. So how to exploit uh, scale invariance is that, uh, well, um, in the portfolio choice problem, scale invariance was uh, obvious, right? Because when the agent has more wealth, what remains invariant is basically the allocation to the risky asset and the, and the risk-free asset. And, and here, uh, what's, what would be the analog of the agent's wealth? 
is that, well, we have to look at the agent's promised utility and uh, renormalize it. And instead of talking about utility in uh, utils, uh, to convert utility into utility in, uh, in money, basically. So in, in units which are, which are linear in money. Okay? So basically, this is, a, this is a transformation of the agent's utility. Okay? So, um, so instead of, uh, so basically this is, uh, for the agent's risk aversion coefficient, this is the agent's utility in, in money. And uh, the, the bigger X is, the bigger is the agent's utility in money, the more room the principal has to punish the agent, th then the agent can be trusted pr uh, with more capital proportionately. So basically that's, that's how scale invariance comes into this picture. So when the agent has a bigger X, he can have proportionately more capital. That's one of the things that matters. But another thing that matters here is uh, uh, the precautionary motive. Okay. And the precautionary motive is uh, the, the relevant ratio that captures the precautionary motive here is the ratio of uh, how much the agent is consuming right now uh, relative to his future utility. So basically, that's the ratio. And let me try to convince you that this captures the precautionary motive. So this ratio, we call it uh, C hat. And uh, what is this ratio in, uh, in those stationary contracts that I talked about earlier? Okay. So in those stationary contracts, there is a, a simple formula that captures uh, this ratio. Okay. Um, and uh, this is, okay, so in, inside the parentheses, this is the consumption rate. Uh, this is the consumption rate, right? Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there is, so basically, you know, you can, you can do the algebra to, to basically to confirm this. I guess you have to trust me that this is correct. Uh, so, but, but here what happens is that, okay, so gamma can be bigger or one or, or less than one. So this could be increasing or decreasing in risk. But then there is also a power, right? So the joint effect is that uh, when the agent is exposed to more risk, we do not know if he's consuming more or less because uh, uh, the, the consumption rate, we do not know if it's going to be relative to wealth. We do not know if it's going to be more or less because there is income effect or substitution effect. But uh, it, it affects C hat always the same way. Okay, uh, and uh, so, so we are not measuring consumption relative to the agent's wealth, but we are measuring consumption relative to this transformation of utility. Okay, so uh, the more risk, so this is declining in uh, the risk exposure. So the more risk the agent is exposed to, the lower is C hat, okay? Uh, and so, uh, so C hat, the, the highest value it can attain is if the agent is not exposed to any risk at all. And this is the upper bound, okay? Uh, and when the agent has a greater precautionary motive, then, then C hat is going to be less. So he's going to be consuming less relative to the uh, upper bound, okay? So, um, okay, so, so the good news is that at this point, I think, we are uh, set up for this slide. This is a very important slide uh, because I can try to give some intuition about what the optimal contract looks like uh, from this slide. Okay, and uh, this is a good point because there are only five minutes left. Uh, okay, time for lunch. So, um, so the power of incentives comes from the sensitivity of the agent's utility to uh, to realize the returns, okay? And uh, so if the principal wants to give the agent incentives, the principal has to uh, reward the agent after good outcomes and punish him after bad outcomes. But how much? Well, how much depends on the incentive constraint. So if the principal wants to give the agent more capital, then... Uh, uh, then the agent also has more to steal. Uh, so then the, the, the principal has to expose the agent to more risk. So delta has to be bigger. Okay. 
But then another thing that uh, affects incentives is the precautionary motive. So if the agent expects, the fear is that he's going to be exposed to a lot of risk in the future, then he's going to be consuming less because, uh, uh, because of the Euler equation, the precautionary motive. Uh, and then his incentives are going to be even stronger. Okay? So suppose that we start from the other key. So the agent is investing in his own. Okay. And we think about the ways that the principal can uh, uh, improve the outcome. Okay? So let's think about stationary contracts first, how those stationary contracts work. So, so one of the things uh, um, we can think about is that, well, uh, you know, the agent can generate alpha from the capital that he manages. So maybe what the principal should do is that the principal should give the agent even more capital relative to other key so that the, the agent can generate bigger alpha. So basically go in this direction relative to other key. So is it going to make things better? Um, and well, if the principal gives the agent more capital, it also means that the uh, principal has to expose the agent to more risk, okay? So suppose that uh, relative to other keep, the principal moves in this direction. Okay, you know, the uh, agent gets more capital, he's exposed to more risk, and suppose that the principal ignores what happens to the agent's precautionary motive. So, of course, what hap what's going to happen is that the agent's precautionary motive is going to go up. So, so if, the, if, uh, if the principal gives the agent more capital and exposes the agent to more risk, okay, so now the agent is concerned about all of this risk exposure. So he would want to save. So his consumption will go down and precautionary motive will rise. And, and, and then uh, because he's concerned that he's exposed to all of this risk down the line, his incentives are basically going to be, well, he's going to steal from resources right now and put it away so that if he gets punished in the future, um, uh, then, uh, then he's protected, okay? So, so okay, so, but then you're gonna tell me, well, like what is the principal doing? The principal is not giving the agent enough incentives. The principal should just expose the agent to even more risk to compensate for the additional precautionary motive, okay? And uh, we can move into this direction and give the, the agent more capital, but because of this amplification, because exposing to more risk creates the precautionary motive, which generates exposing the agent to even more risk, so providing even harder incentives until the agent doesn't want to basically uh, steal and save anymore. We can, we can go in that direction. So because of this amplification, it actually makes things worse. And then in the stationary contract, if you move in this direction, it makes things worse, okay? And so a better contract is moving in the opposite direction and uh, you actually give the agent a more boring contract. You restrict his risk and, and you provide some insurance and this is actually better. Uh, the agent is managing less capital uh, and uh, his precautionary motive is, is, is weakened and basically because, uh, because the agent is risk averse, things are better. But it's not very exciting, okay? And what would be more exciting is actually try to move into that direction to give the agent more capital, but to try in, in, in some ways to control the precautionary motive. And the thing to realize here is that if you give the agent more capital, then the agent's precautionary motive comes from his future expectation of the risk exposure. The, the risk exposure right now doesn't matter because the agent doesn't, doesn't have a chance to protect himself against right now, but he has incentives to protect against the future. And this is exactly where distortions come in. So you, you give the agent more capital and uh, you commit to expose him to less risk in the future. So you give him a safer contract in the future. And this is exactly how the optimal contract works. So relative to other key, the optimal contract actually gives the agent more capital, but in the future, uh, so, so basically, what does it mean to give the agent more capital? So, so here, the, the optimal portfolio choice math comes about in the scale invariance. Give, give more capital means a bigger portfolio weight on the risky asset. So you give a bigger portfolio weight on the risky asset right now, but you commit to a lower portfolio weight uh, on the risky asset in the future, which reduces the precautionary motive. Uh, and, and so ex, 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 exposed, you, you create these distortions, and these distortions uh, help ex ante, okay? 
so, uh, and there's, there's one more thing, but since I'm out of time, uh, uh, one more feature of the optimal contract, but since I'm out of time, I'm not going to tell you today, but tomorrow. So, uh, so, so tomorrow, so this is in words, okay? This is in words, but, but tomorrow uh, I can roll up my sleeves, uh, which I cannot do today, <laughs> and go through some math. Okay, so, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could just scale up capital at time zero very, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and then the agent will basically get a chunk of this. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you just sort of <coughs> trivial, you know, like there would be no risk of, you know, like this, this CT minus one would just go to zero. And, uh, yeah. So your question, in other words, is can you get first best this way? Yeah. So can, can you get infinite profit? So, and the answer is, if alpha is sufficiently high, then you can get first best. But if alpha is, uh, you know, only 10%, then, then maybe you cannot. So you need parameter restrictions in order to avoid getting first best, yeah. So let's continue the discussion on Anish. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you.